Our next speaker is also, I would say, equally important to this disease, and she may or may not know it, but I'm quite certain she is. Dr. Gilmore actually just joined our IU faculty here this past year. Um, you know, she's really making a tremendous impact in patients' lives, and it actually goes to the idea of obesity and the medical management of obesity. And as you'll probably learn, we think there may be something to do with fatty liver disease and or NASH and how it interplays with autoimmune hepatitis. So she's actually, and her, her and her team are working to develop a dedicated medical weight loss clinic here at IU that we are trying to figure out how we can implement with liver patients. Yeah. Good. So if you'll join me in welcoming Dr. Gilmore. Hi, everybody. I uh, see that the itinerary was very full today, so thank you for staying for this final talk. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is body composition and how that affects uh, people with autoimmune hepatitis. What I hope that you are able to get from this talk is what is body composition, how, how does that relate to obesity, how does that affect liver health and autoimmune hepatitis and then what to do with it? So body composition is a term that I want you guys to incorporate into your vocabulary. You know, when we think about obesity, we typically think about weight, but it's so much more complicated than that. Body composition looks at the components of what makes up your body. So fat, bone, organs, Water, blood, all of that stuff is include, I'm sorry, included in body composition. This is a picture that is actually pretty common um, on the internet. You can, if you Google body composition, you can find something similar to this. This was just taken from an English uh, periodical that shows these women who are all the same weight and how they obviously have very different body compositions. So body composition can be measured in directly and indirectly in many different ways. Uh, we use height and weight very, very often, and that's probably one of the easiest ways to indirectly measure body composition. Height and weight can be used to calculate body mass index. Another indirect way to look at body composition is waist measurement, so just going across your waist around um, near your belly button. And what that can give us is an idea of visceral fat within your abdomen. That's the fat that is around your organs and is considered to be the dangerous fat. Additionally, I'm sure many of you are familiar with skin fold um, thickness where they use the calibers, and that can also be used to give an estimate of body fat percentage. So some ways that are a little bit more scientific, utilizing radiology. In this particular picture, a DEXA scan, which you may be familiar with DEXA scan. It's used to look at how, your, how strong your bones are. That's probably how most of us think of DEXA scan. It can also be used to look at not only bone mass, but lean muscle mass and also fat mass. This is more often than not used in studies. Uh, there are some places where you can say, hey, I want to get this done and have a, an idea of what my body fat percentage is, but more often than not, it's going to be used in clinical studies. Impedance, uh, bioelectrical impedance measurement. This, we actually use this here in the clinic that I, that I have. Bioelectrical impedance measurement, you get up, it looks like a scale. You uh, have to go to the bathroom before you get on it because it can be altered by body water. Uh, barefoot, put your hands on some probes, and it sends an impulse through your body. That impulse will travel at different rates, whether it's through fat, bone, or water, and um, it goes through a calculation, and it can tell you how much of those different components of your body you have. So it's a really uh, pretty good uh, way to get an idea of body fat percentage. And then some of you are probably familiar with water or air displacement. Uh, water displacement, just what you're thinking, you get into the tub of water and 
the water rises, and from that there's a, an estimate of body fat percentage. This is a picture of a bod pod, kind of a similar uh, idea. You get in it, and it's a displacement of air. It's, it's actually a pretty cool um, machine, and a lot of centers do have this available. There are also, there's a gym on campus here that has it available. So this may be something that you can um, find in your own hometown. Now, despite all that fancy stuff, go back around to BMI. This is one of the most commonly used measurements um, for indirectly looking at body fat percentage. And this is just a list of BMIs and what that means and how we consider um, and what we consider that BMI to be related to in terms of body fat percentage. And it's actually been shown to be a relatively good indicator. So this is a super old, well, it's not super old, but this is an older study from the 90s um, that really looks at how body fat percentage and BMI are related across not only the sexes, but also different age groups. And it shows a, a pretty good correlation. I don't know if you guys are familiar with these maps. This was, um, these are directly taken from the CDC website. And they are maps that show the prevalence of obesity across the United States. And I bring these up just to give you an idea of why this is important. This is something that is affecting every single state. And in every single state, from year to year, the prevalence increases. So the green is a lower prevalence then it goes yellow, orange, and red. And you can see the trend, more yellow, more orange, more orange and red. So every single year, those numbers are increasing. Why is this important to you? Oh, and there's another one. So estimates based on what we know uh, are that by the year 2030, greater than 50% of the United States is going to be obese. Those estimates correlate with the same uh, pretty staggering estimates of fatty liver disease in the United States. Based on some studies, we know that about 70% of people who have obesity or even just overweight actually already have fatty infiltration into their liver. And of those people, approximately 20% have NASH, which is that very dangerous inflammation of the liver that can actually uh, progress to cirrhosis. This is just a slide that outlines some of the other disorders that may or may not be associated with fatty liver. Not that fatty liver causes these, but that they are often seen in people who also have fatty liver. So high blood pressure, cholesterol problems, insulin resistance or diabetes, and then cardiovascular disease um, is correlated, not caused by, but correlated um, with, this, uh, with fatty liver disease as one of the most common causes of death in these patients, and that is if they don't have problems with um, the liver primarily. Then cirrhosis can occur, again, in those people who have NASH, that dangerous inflammation of the liver, and cirrhosis uh, predisposes to a risk for liver cancer. So for this group, the reason that this is important is over the um, past several years, there have been some questions of, you know, can autoimmune hepatitis and fatty liver disease coexist in uh, the same patient? We think yes, and we, there's been very good evidence that yes, patients can have both of these diseases. And what does that mean? So in some preliminary studies and smaller studies, we've seen that fatty liver disease makes autoimmune hepatitis um, worse. They have, these patients have a more serious course. Uh, additionally, in patients who also have NASH, they have a more aggressive um, course towards cirrhosis and also an increased mortality. So it can be very serious to have both of these diseases. Unfortunately, in the past, because I don't think this was very well appreciated, um, some people were, would 
you come into the doctor's office, you have your liver tests are off, um, and it's attributed to one or the other. So one disease was not being adequately treated. A lot of patients were probably had overlap, but it was just, oh, you've got fatty liver disease, you just need to lose weight. And so there was a delay in diagnosis of their autoimmune hepatitis. This is a super complicated slide, but important. This was a study done using mice who um, were specially bred to, when given a special virus, these mice um, exhibit features of human autoimmune hepatitis. So what they did was they studied these mice um, after giving them two different diets, a high-fat diet and just a low-standard diet. The mice with the high-fat diet had higher body weights. Then they injected these mice with uh, this virus that causes their livers to act like human autoimmune hepatitis. And what they saw was in the mice who were fed the high-fat diet, they had worse liver enzymes. Those, do I have a pointer? These two charts show that the ALT and AST in the high-fat diet mice were higher. And then this graph right here shows that those mice, the high-fat diet mice, also had an increase in um, scarring of the liver. And I think you guys, a lot of people did uh, the fibrosis scans today, so something similar. So treatment for fatty liver. Weight loss, um, specifically though, uh, excess fat loss, and um, gaining lean muscle mass. So the gaining lean muscle mass, I'm not going to touch on too much today. It's a little out of the scope of um, this talk, but uh, that means not only do you need cardiovascular exercise, which is very important, but you actually have to do resistance training. Um, and that's going and doing actual weight lifting or even using something like a resistance band uh, is, is very, very useful. In terms of weight loss, though, um, I want you guys to really imprint this in your head. This is not about doing just one thing. It's not about just waking up and saying, I'm going to exercise today and not eat fast food, or vice versa. I'm not going to eat fast food, but I don't need to exercise. You really have to have all of the components of a good, comprehensive weight loss plan in order to achieve success and actually maintain the weight loss. So good nutrition, which we had a lovely nutrition talk already, um, exercise, and again, that's cardiovascular exercise and resistance training, behavior modification, and I maybe could have made that pillar a little bigger. If you don't actually make these lifestyle changes and, um, in a way that you can maintain them, it's hard to maintain the weight loss, no matter how you choose to lose weight. And then that health pillar is you know, doing this in cooperation with your doctor. People who are on a lot of medications, those medications may, be, um, need, may need to be adjusted, uh, especially diabetes medications and hypertension medications. So you want to do this um, in cooperation with someone who can help you. Obesity treatment um, is somewhat dependent upon where we, we're still using BMI to kind of lead this. So it's somewhat dependent upon BMI. But every single person, you can see I put an X in all of the boxes by exercise, diet, behavior modification. Because even if you use a medicine, you get surgery, or you um, want to do one of these newer endoscopic procedures, if you don't do those basic behavioral lifestyle changes, you can regain weight. I won't spend too much time on this slide. Uh, there are tons of different diets out there. There's not really great evidence that any one is so significantly better than the other. I will say, though, that being consistent in the diet that you choose, and when I say diet, I don't mean you know just being low calorie, just what you put in. Being consistent is probably what makes the biggest difference. So if you try to do a low-fat diet and you hate it, you're probably not going to stick with it. So choose something that you can stick with and that you can be consistent with. There are tons of different medicines out there that um, have been uh, shown to help with weight loss. 
not all are appropriate for every person, and none are magic pills. So with any of these medicines, you still have to you know, stick to those pillars of a comprehensive weight loss program. I'm not gonna go through any of these um, individually except for kind of the new kids on the block. Um, you guys may have seen commercials for a medicine called Belvique. Uh, this affects brain chemistry in a way that helps in people feel more satiated. Uh, it's fairly expensive. Um, the company does offer coupons, so if you are seeing a physician and interested in this particular medicine, be sure to ask for um, some help or website, the company website, so that you can get that coupon. This was recently approved, as was Qsimia. This is a combination of two drugs that are old drugs. It helps increase metabolism as well as uh, create that feeling of being satiated. Um, the combination pill is a little expensive again, and the company does offer coupons. <coughs> Contrave, another combination um, medicine of two older um, therapies that are not used uh, necessarily for weight loss um, individually. This is probably the more expensive of the three new ones. Um, the Contrave company, again, offers a coupon. Any uh, one of these medicines are probably good for approximately 10% excess body weight loss. In some people, it's even more um, successful. And all three of them are going to be even more successful if combined with a really good diet and exercise. I won't spend too much time on the different uh, surgical options Lap band, this has been around since uh, the 80s and has a pretty decent uh, percent of excess uh, weight loss. It's uh, removable and considered to be a fairly um, easy procedure to do. Sleeve gastrectomy, another surgical procedure, uh, better excess body weight um, loss with this one. And it's exactly what you see up there. It's a restrictive procedure. They take off part of the stomach. The gold standard brew and wine gastric bypass. This probably has the best excess weight loss associated with it. This is a restrictive procedure because they create a small pouch. So you can only eat so much. Um, and then repipe your intestines so that you're actually only absorbing. It's a pretty decent percentage, but a percentage of um, what you intake. The endoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, this is a newer technique, and it utilizes endoscopy. I think many of you have probably had endoscopy. Long scope, light and a camera at the end of it, through the mouth, into the stomach, um, and user, using a, a device that fits over the scope, they can stitch the inside of the stomach. So it is achieves something similar to the sleeve gastrectomy, but without the surgery. Endoscopic intragastric balloon. This has been used around the world for 20 years, but was recently approved in the United States uh, in 2015. Pretty decent weight loss with this. Um, this is, as in the slide, indicated for people with a BMI over 30 and less than 40. So just a couple of takeaways. This is a lot of information, and please ask questions. But things that you can do now if you think that you're in one of these categories of being at risk for fatty liver disease, keep a food journal. People don't understand or really recognize most, most of the time how much they're actually eating or what they're eating. Read the food labels. You'd be surprised what's in your food. And it's also very surprising sometimes you know, how much um, the caloric value of the food that you're about to intake. I like to recommend doing protein-centric meals, meaning you want to have a little bit of protein with every meal that you uh, intake. It helps keep you satiated, and it gives you a longer, um, it's a, how, how would you say, it's a compact calorie, so it, it can take you longer throughout your day. Physical activity, again, resistance training is very, very important. And probably most importantly, consistency. 
whatever method you choose for weight loss, being consistent will help you be successful. That's what I got.